morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Daniel Heron today. Dr. Heron received his undergraduate degree in computer science from Harvard College and his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania. He completed general surgery residency and research fellowship training at Tufts University and laparoscopic surgery fellowship training at Legacy Health System in Portland, Oregon with Lee L. Swanson. Dr. Heron is System Chief of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery at the Mount Sinai Health System and also serves as the Chief of the Garlock Division of General Surgery at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. As the Zalke Professor of Surgery, he directs the Clinical Fellowship in Advanced Gastrointestinal, Minimally Invasive, and Bariatric Surgery and has trained 28 laparoscopic and bariatric fellows since 1999. He's an active leader in the field of minimally invasive surgery with extensive publications in both laparoscopic and bariatric surgery, editorial board positions in multiple major journals, and fellowship titles in both the American College of Surgeons and the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. A very warm welcome to Dr. Heron this morning. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Levin and Dr. Thomas. It's a real uh, privilege and an honor. And as I said, it's very intimidating for a surgeon to be in front of so many internists all at once. Uh, but if you promise not to gang up on me, I'd, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, the topic which is near and dear to my heart, uh, metabolic and bariatric surgery. Let me start off by sharing my screen here. Are you able to see my slides there? Excellent. Yeah, we're good. Okay, very good. Um, so as my topic today, I'd like to talk about primarily about the surgical treatment of obesity and metabolic disease, but also a little bit about the medical treatment of obesity and metabolic disease and, and uh, our vision of how things are going to be, uh, how we're going to be treating obesity uh, in, the, in the near and, and long-term future. Um, as my disclosures, I should say that I'm a, a consultant to a small uh, surgical company up in Boston, uh, but my bigger disclosure is that I am a surgeon. So as a surgeon, I am biased. I, I enjoy surgery. I earn my living doing surgery. And so I guess I do have a little bit of a surgically uh, biased point of view. So I'll just come right out and say that. So is it metabolic surgery or is it bariatric surgery that we're talking about? Well, about 14 years ago, our, our, our surgical society that focuses on bariatric surgery, which was called the American Society for Bariatric Surgery changed its name to the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery with, uh, with the understanding that more and more we're using operations like gastric bypass or sleep gastrectomy, not really to treat just obesity, but to treat all the different disease processes that are so associated with obesity, things like type two diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, sleep apnea, asthma, degenerative joint disease, and, and the list goes on and on and on, and it seems like we're adding to that list every day. In terms of who we're performing surgery on, uh, amazingly enough, we're still using the same guidelines, which have been around for 30 years. There was a consensus conference uh, sponsored by the NIH back in 1992, and at that time, uh, it was determined that the appropriate audience for this operation was uh, those with a body mass index greater than 40 or greater than 35 with weight-related comorbidities. And for the past 30 years, we've pretty much been going by these same, uh, these same requirements. Interestingly, you know, these days, no one needs to explain what a BMI is, but uh, if you were giving this talk 20 years ago, the concept of BMI was really not very widely used and you had to, uh, had to identify it with a formula. So at Mount Sinai, we're going by these 30-year-old NIH criteria looking at a BMI greater than 40 or a BMI greater than 35 with a major comorbidity. Typically, our patients are older than 15 and younger than 70. However, those are not rigid limits. Generally, patients have tried a multiple dieting attempts in the past before they get to the point of trying a surgical approach for weight loss. And of course, they need to be uh, an acceptable surgical risk and they need to be able to comply with the post-operative uh, regimen. There are several different operations out there, and I think it's worth spending a little time just to understand how these operations are the same and how they're different. So what I'd like to talk about are, are the, the more common operations like gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. Those really comprise the operations that we're doing here at Mount Sinai. But I'd like to touch on some of the less common or obsolete operations like lap band and biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch. Gastric bypass for many years was considered to be the gold standard operation against which all the other bariatric operations were judged. And it's still a very common operation and a pretty good operation. 
Um, in this operation, we use a surgical stapler to separate the stomach into a small gastric pouch, usually about 30 cc's or so in volume, about the size of an egg. Uh, and it's completely separated from the lower part of the stomach, which we call the gastric remnant. Um, this st small stomach pouch then gets connected to the rule limb, which is a 100 centimeter length of jejunum, which is divided from the biliopancreatic limb. So you end up with kind of a Y-shaped connection. You've got the food path coming down through the gastric pouch and into the rule limb. Uh, whereas you have this big section of bypass stomach, which is only passing gastric secretions, bile, and pancreatic secretions. Um, it was first used in 1967, so this operation has been around at least in its open form for many, many years. It's well tolerated by patients, but because you are bypassing the proximal part of the uh, jejunum as well as all of the duodenum, it does require supplements for those vitamins and minerals which are absorbed in that area. Typically, patients will spend two or three hours in the operating room. They'll spend one night in the hospital recovering from the surgery. There's a fairly extended post-operative course. We have uh, a two-week post-operative visit to check on their incisions and make sure they're healing okay. But then we follow up with our patients at four months, eight months, 12 months, and then on an annual basis, essentially forever. And the reason that we want to do that is to measure their vitamin levels, calcium, iron, B12 levels, and uh, to make sure that their weight loss is continuing. And generally what we tell patients to expect is that they're gonna lose somewhere between 20 to 30% of their total body weight over the 12 to 18 months following surgery. This is the way our operating look, our operating room looks. This is room 24 uh, in Guggenheim 3 in the West Tower. And this is the way we would have the operating room configured for a bariatric operation. There are some things that we need to pay particular attention to when we're operating on a, on a heavy patient. You can see that um, we have a lot of padding on the operating room table. Uh, the patients are actually in a split leg position, which allows us to stand between the legs and to get better access to the upper mid abdomen, which is where the stomach and the duodenum are located. Um, we have foot plates, as you can see on the operating table, which allows us to put the uh, operating table into a steep Trendelenburg or reverse Trendelenburg position, which allows us to move some of the fat out of the way so we can get access to the stomach and the liver. And then you can see we have a, a, a bunch of advanced laparoscopic instruments. We have our uh, insufflators, which allow us to insufflate the abdomen with carbon dioxide so we have a working space. Uh, we have some uh, high, high power light sources and we have some advanced energy sources to divide tissues. This is what it looks like when we're doing uh, a laparoscopic gastric bypass. We start off by using uh, a laparoscope that looks through a small plastic trocar with a point at the tip to essentially drill our way through the abdominal wall into the abdomen. Once we get inside, we inflate the abdomen with carbon dioxide gas to give ourselves a working space. And we lift the liver out of the way with a metal retractor. And this gives us a pretty nice view of the stomach over here. So this is a very close up view of the gastroesophageal junction right here. And this big purple thing over on the right is our spleen. And we start off by freeing up some of the peritoneum which is holding the stomach in place. And then we take the stomach and retract it off to the side and we use some laparoscopic dissecting instruments to create a small path behind the stomach, which is gonna allow us to do our first part of the stapling to create the stomach pouch. These instruments look giant when you look at them under this magnification, but these graspers are only uh, five millimeters in diameter. And this stapler that we're using here to divide, to start dividing the stomach to create the stomach pouch is only 12 millimeters in diameter. So it's about a half an inch in diameter. So you can see we fire the stapler first across the bottom of the pouch and then we fire it up parallel to the lesser curvature. There's a lot of connective tissue behind the stomach that connects it to the spleen. So we have to very carefully separate the stomach from the spleen. And usually one or two or maybe three staplings, uh, stapler firings is what we need to completely disconnect the stomach from the stomach remnant that you see on the right side. Here's the final staple firing. And what we end up with is a roughly 20 cc stomach pouch on the left side of the screen, which is completely separated from the gastric remnant on the right side of the screen. So our next job is to create a connection between the small stomach pouch and the, the jejunum. Here's some more of that connective tissue that goes from the stomach down to the pancreas. So that needs to be cleared off. This dissector we're using is an ultrasonic dissector, which has a jaw which vibrates at ultrasonic frequencies and cuts through the tissue. Then we take the transverse colon, we lift that upwards. 
we find the ligament of trites, which is where the jejunum enters the abdomen. There's the ligament of trites right up there at the top, essentially the beginning of the small bowel within the abdomen. And then we approximate uh, about 50 centimeters worth uh, length of bowel, which is gonna be the length of our biliopancreatic limb. The way we estimate it is by knowing that the silver portions of our instruments are about five centimeters long. And we use that as a, as a rough ruler. We then bring the small intestine up to the stomach. We make a small opening in the stomach using that ultrasonic scalpel or a different energy device. Then we make a similar opening in the small intestine. Then we use that same linear stapler that we use to staple the stomach into two parts. Uh, only here we're using it to create a connection between the two pieces of bowel. So we put one jaw of the stapler into the stomach, the other jaw into the small intestine. We fire them together and that will create a stapled connection between the stomach pouch and the jejunum. And here, you, if you look inside, you can see the lumen of the stomach, which is now connected to the lumen of the small bowel. This is an orogastric tube, which is placed by anesthesia, and it allows us to confirm that everything is patent and that we have not narrowed our connection between the stomach and the small intestine. But obviously, you can see there's, there's still a hole in the bowel where we had to insert the stapler, so this needs to be closed, and we're going to use old-fashioned suturing technique to uh, close up that remaining hole. So the same way we would use suturing in an open operation, we use suturing in a laparoscopic uh, procedure using laparoscopic needle drivers. But we're using the same suture material that we would use in an open operation. This is uh, a silk or a, a vicryl absorbable suture that we suture using laparoscopic instruments. And that uh, allows us to completely close up the uh, opening in the bowel. Generally, we'll use two layers. So we have kind of belt and suspenders approach in case one of the layers were to have a small leak. The other layer would, uh, would make sure that uh, it was not a full thickness leak. And this gives us our connection between the stomach pouch and the small intestine. Now we still haven't created that Y-shaped anatomy. We have this kind of loop that's connected to the stomach. So we have to convert this loop to a Y. So here we're opening up the mesentery of the bowel right at the top of the loop and we're using the stapler to divide the loop and this is going to allow us to create that y-shaped connection which is part of the ruan y anatomy so now we have our stomach pouch connected to our rule limb here and we'll go on to do uh, a similar kind of stapled anastomosis between the biliopancreatic limb that you see at the upper right corner of the screen and this rule limb which we're counting off 100 centimeters on now so we'll end up with a 100 centimeter long rule limb and a 50 centimeter long biliopancreatic limb. And that gives us Ruan Y anatomy. I won't bore you with the details of the distal anastomosis, but it looks very similar to the way we did the proximal with the, the linear stapler inserted with a one jaw into each of those segments of bowel. Now, gastric bypass for many years was really the operation that we were doing for weight loss purposes, but the sleep gastrectomy uh, has really taken its place. The sleep gastrectomy is a much simpler operation to describe. All we're doing is taking the oval stomach and we are removing the left-hand side of the stomach or the greater curvature of the stomach, leaving us with a long, narrow, banana-shaped stomach, essentially. Some patients get confused that we call it a sleeve gastrectomy and they think that a sleeve is placed over the stomach to kind of restrict it. But uh, it's just called a sleeve because the stomach ends up being long and narrow, just like the sleeve of a jacket. We calibrate it uh, by putting a 13 millimeter diameter bougie down through the esophagus into the stomach so we can give everyone a uniformly sized stomach. Um, it's a much simpler operation both to explain and to manage because we're not bypassing any of the small intestine with this operation. So it's essentially a lower maintenance uh, operation for the patients. We are still removing a lot of the acid producing tissue in the stomach. So patients are still required to take some supplements like multivitamins and calcium as well as B12. Sleep gastrectomy was actually performed for the first time here in our division at Mount Sinai. We uh, started doing them in 2001, not as a primary operation, but for patients who were so heavy that it was 
just technically challenging to do a full gastric bypass. So for these patients, we figured uh, for, for those of us, uh, those patients with a greater than 60 kilogram per uh, meter squared BMI, um, we would do a sleeve gastrectomy. And then once they had lost hundred pounds or so, it would be much technically easier for us to move forward uh, with the second part and to complete the gastric bypass. But uh, what we noticed is that many patients were so happy with the weight loss that they had from this first stage operation that it really became their only stage operation. And that, and that was the beginning of the sleeve gastrectomy. It was reported by uh, Dr. Regan, who was our fellow back in 2002. And it was, uh, this was published in an obesity surgery journal in 2003. The timeline for sleeve gastrectomy is almost identical to that for the gastric bypass. It's still a couple of hours in the operating room, one night stay in the hospital, the same office visits for that first year and then forever, uh, and similar vitamin and calcium supplementation. The weight loss we tell patients to expect is similar to what they would get from a gastric bypass. Now, many of you are also familiar with the lap band or the laparoscopic adjustable gastric band, which is the generic term for it. Um, you can see I've put a line through that and I'm presenting this only to say that this is an obsolete operation that we don't do anymore. But you may still come across patients who have had one of these lap bands placed. This was approved by the FDA in 2001. I'm a little, little bit embarrassed to say that at, at Mount Sinai, we were actually part of the FDA trial to get this device approved. Uh, embarrassed because it has not proven to be a very successful uh, device. Uh, but this is essentially a, a small plastic ring which was wrapped around the upper stomach and it had a balloon on the inside which could be inflated with saline. The saline was accessed through a subcutaneous port, almost like a chemotherapy port. And by injecting saline, you could make the balloon fill up and constrict the stomach further. Um, it did result in, 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 in some reason, some people had reasonable weight loss, some people had resolution of their comorbidities, but there were a lot of adverse events and a lot of people ended up with uh, poor weight loss and a lot of vomiting and esophageal motility issues. So this operation is uh, for all intents and purposes, no longer done in the United States. And then finally, it is worth mentioning uh, this operation, the biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch. Um, this had been performed for about 20 or 30 years. It was first done laparoscopically here at Mount Sinai uh, back in 1999, but it's almost like a combination of a sleeve gastrectomy where the left side of the stomach is removed plus a bypass operation. So it's both a sleeve and a bypass together because the arms of the bypass bowel are very, very long. There's a lot of malabsorption that goes on with this operation. So it becomes a very high maintenance opera operation for patients because they're uh, malabsorbing so much fat. They end up with somewhat loose stools, diarrhea, uh, changes in their body odor. They need to take a huge number of vitamins because they're malabsorbing all their fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And so it's uh, never really comprised more than 1% of the operations that we do for weight loss purposes in the United States. And I think it is interesting to look at what has changed over the past 10 years, looking at the different bariatric operations out there. I'll draw your attention to 2011. So that's 10 years ago. And back at that point, gastric bypass, Ruan Y gastric bypass was still the most common operation with 36% of all cases. But right on its heels was the lap band. 35% of all bariatric operations in the United States were lap bands. The sleeve was very distant, uh, a distant third at 17.8%. But you can see that over the next few years, there was significant change and by, um, Two years after that point, sleeve had jumped from 17% to 42% and was all of a sudden the most common operation done in the United States. Band had dropped from 35 to 14%. And if you look at the progression over time, by 2018, the band was representing only about 1% of the operations and it's even less right now. Sleeve has jumped up to about 60% of operations in the United States. And as you'll see from the Mount Sinai numbers, which we'll look at in a minute, uh, it's even more popular here at Mount Sinai. How many operations are we doing here in the health system? Uh, well, we're doing bariatric surgery at South Nassau, at Morningside, Beth Israel, here and at Queens. And if you add up all those cases, uh, it was a little over 1,700 cases in the last year for which we had a, a normal numbers, which was 2019. Um, so it's a lot of bariatric surgery that we're doing here. And if you look just at Mount Sinai Hospital, these are our numbers uh, for for first quarter comparing 2020 to 2021. 
there's some interesting trends that you can see here, even in the past year. Uh, you can see that um, sleeve gastrectomy is, is definitely the most common operation uh, compared to Ruan Y, but we've uh, moved substantially from doing it laparoscopically to doing it using the surgical robot, the intuitive surgical robot. It's essentially the same operation, but instead of holding the laparoscopic instruments in our hand, we're using the surgical robot to manipulate the instruments and perform the same operation. Uh, but you can see that from uh, 2020 uh, to 2021, uh, the number of operations done laparoscopically has dropped from 58 to 29 percent, and the number done robotically has increased from 19 to 41 percent. Um, overall, uh, sleeve is comprising in, in uh, this year for our first quarter. It's about 70% uh, of the operations. Uh, Ruan Y gastric bypass is about 15% of the operation. And the, re the remainder are different types of conversions and sleeves from one operation to another. What kind of weight loss do we see with these operations? Certainly one of the longest running studies and one of the longest running groups of patients uh, who've been followed uh, are, there, are the Swedish obesity study patients. Um, Sweden is, is remarkably good at, at longitudinal studies for their population. Uh, and they published one of the earliest studies uh, back in, in the 1990s, uh, looking at long-term outcomes for patients undergoing uh, gastric banding, uh, vertical banded gastroplasty, which is very similar and kind of an old obsolete operation, similar to banding, and also gastric bypass. There are actually no sleeve gastrectomies in this series because sleeve didn't exist at the time that the study was done. But this gives us 10 year follow up from the Swedish cohort, uh, which included also patients who were not treated with surgery, but were followed uh, with um, medical control of their obesity. Uh, the control group you can see had uh, relatively stable weight over the course of this 15 year follow up. Um, gastric bands ultimately by 15 years had only about a 13% total body weight loss, whereas bypa bypass resulted in a roughly 25% total body weight loss. Interestingly, you can see that the curve, although the curves are somewhat parallel, um, they all have the same shape. Um, get, it seems like most of the weight loss occurs in the first 12 to 18 months after surgery. And then there's gradual weight regain for all of the operations, starting at about year two and going out to about year six or eight. And at that point, things seem to stabilize. Why do these operations work? Well, traditionally, we've always taught that there are three mechanisms that result in weight loss. There's the restriction, which is merely we're making the stomach smaller. So patients eat less food, they feel full after eating a smaller meal. There's malabsorption, which results from bypassing part of the intestine. And patients who have a Ruan Y type anatomy get something called dumping syndrome, where they have a negative reaction to eating sweets. And so they're somewhat discouraged from, from eating uh, concentrated carbohydrates. More recently, we're thinking that it's, it's much more of a, a hormonal basis for, uh, for the weight loss after surgery. The first hormone that was identified, which was directly related to the control of hunger, was ghrelin. Um, this was found about 20 years ago and, and reported by David Cummings in the New England Journal. Um, ghrelin was found to have uh, a kind of phasic uh, level throughout the day. It was highest around breakfast time and then would rise around lunchtime and would rise around dinner time and then would rise again around midnight or two in the morning. Uh, and it was felt that the, the, the cycles of ghrelin were responsible for uh, feelings of hunger. Interestingly, if you look at this line down here, uh, the line at the bottom, which you can see is flat and doesn't have this diurnal variation, is the gastric bypass group. So patients who underwent gastric bypass somehow seem to have their ghrelin levels completely changed from uh, control patients. And another question which we've been struggling to figure out is why does diabetes, why does type two diabetes improve so significantly after a gastric bypass? The improvement in blood sugars takes place almost immediately within a day or two after gastric bypass before there's been any significant weight loss. So is it a function of decreased caloric intake, decreased carbohydrate intake, excluding food from certain parts of the GI tract, like the antrum or the duodenum or proximal jejunum. There have been a lot of different mechanisms proposed, and it's probably some combination of these mechanisms that results in the, in the huge improvement in type 2 diabetes that we see. Um, and as I mentioned, the type 2 diabetes after gastric bypass corrects within a few days postoperatively, and the diabetes correction remains durable, even though the patients are still obese. 
uh, they are losing 20 to 30% of their total body weight, but many of them will still remain 50% or more above their ideal body weight. When I'm talking to patients in the office, there are a couple of points which I try and make very clear, which is that bariatric surgery, as powerful as it is, is not going to cure their obesity. It's not, it's not a cure the same way that taking out your appendix is a cure for appendicitis. It's a tool which needs to be used in conjunction with nutrition and exercise. I draw a crude picture of a three-legged stool and tell my patients that just like a three-legged stool, you need all three of these legs to support a good outcome. And if you get rid of any one of these things, such as poor nutrition or lack of exercise, uh, the stool's going to collapse and you're not going to have a good outcome. I also emphasize to my patients that follow-up is very important. You need to take your vitamins, you need to exercise. And then finally, I tell them that even after a powerful operation like the bypass or the sleeve, you may not be skinny. You'll be a lot thinner than you were, but it's only 20 to 30% of your total body weight that you're losing. Surgery is just one part of the process. The workup that they go through is includes visiting with the surgeon, seeing our nutritionist. Uh, all patients get psychologically cleared for the surgery. Many of them will get an upper endoscopy to make sure there are no lesions in the esophagus or stomach before surgery. And many of them have cardiac or pulmonary or, or sleep, uh, sleep apnea issues uh, for which they'll get different types of medical clearance. Uh, unfortunately, insurance is a big problem. Uh, insurance often requires patients to undergo a uh, six month weight loss program uh, where they have to visit with their internist or with uh, their surgeon once a month, every month for six consecutive months. Uh, and they're very strict about this, such that if patients miss one of these monthly visits, they may deny their surgery. So uh, that is a barrier for patients to get the care that they need. Uh, but it is good that insurance does cover this operation, including Medicare, Medicaid, and, and most of the Medicare and Medicaid HMOs. Some insurance plans do have an exclusion clause, so it is important for patients to find out about that. So does the surgery work? Well, we looked at that Swedish study, and, and this is one of the, the best studies uh, out of this country that looks at the effectiveness and safety of bariatric surgery over the long term. This is uh, from the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Net Clinical Data Network, looking at patients between 2005 and 2015. And this was published three years ago in uh, Annals of Internal Medicine. The outcome variables they were looking at were percent of total body weight loss at one, three, and five years, and also 30-day major adverse events. And they had over 65,000 patients that they were looking at in this study. Again, you can see those same curves that we saw in the, the older Swedish study. Uh, this is lap band at the top. And you can see that patients started off with about a 14% weight loss at one year, which was almost preserved. It was about 12% at five years. A similar, a similar shape curve, but a little bit uh, greater weight loss with sleeve, starting at 25% weight loss and being maintained out to 19% at five years. And bypass seems to have the most weight loss at all with 31% weight loss at one year, maintained to about 26% at five years. Another way to look at it is to just look at the percentage of patients who have greater than 10% of total body weight loss or greater than 20% of total weight loss. And you can see again, band is not so great over here. Bypass and sleeve give much greater numbers of patients with at least a 10% total body weight loss and somewhat lower numbers, but still much better than band with a greater than 20% total body weight loss. In terms of adverse events, um, it's interesting to see that laparoscopic band and sleeve gastrectomy both have an adverse event rate uh, in the mid 2% range. Gastric bypass being a somewhat more complex operation has a higher adverse event rate of, of 5%. So how do we choose which operation we're doing? As I said at Mount Sinai, we're pretty much limited to sleeve gastrectomies and gastric bypasses. And obviously it's a, it's a more subtle uh, uh, algorithm, but to, if you wanted to really summarize it, the, the most important question that we ask our patients is do they have severe GERD or type two diabetes? And if so, we nudge them toward gastric bypass, um, as long as they're able to comply with the post-operative follow-up and diet. Um, if they do not have GERD or type two diabetes, we'll offer them the sleeve gastrectomy, uh, LSG is uh, for laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, um, because as we saw in the, in, in the, art of, in the, the last study, um, it does have a lower rate of adverse events. This is, uh, 
a study from Switzerland, which actually compared sleeve and bypass. It was published in JAMA in 2018, uh, looking at patients who were willing to be randomized to undergoing either sleeve gastrectomy or gastric bypass. This is, uh, uh, I know that uh, in the medical literature, there are a lot of prospective randomized studies out there, but it's very difficult in the surgical realm to get patients to be uh, willing to <laughs> randomize themselves to one operation or the other. Uh, so out of several thousand operations that they saw at the center, they were able to get 217 patients to be willing to be randomized to either sleeve or bypass. And the outcomes that they were looking at were weight loss, resolution of comorbidities, and adverse events. Here they're graphing the results a little bit differently. Um, they're looking not at percent total body weight loss, but actually at excess body mass index loss. Uh, so the curves are flipped upside down, but you can see the same general pattern where most of the weight loss is occurring in the first year, and then there's a little bit of weight regain over the next four years. But the numbers are similar. At five years, the sleeve resulted in 61% of excess weight loss and the bypass resulted in slightly better weight loss. No significant difference between the two. And looking at remission of type two diabetes, the sleeve resulted in a 62% remission at five years and the bypass in a 68% remission at five years. And looking at some of the other comorbidities, you can see that there was really no significant difference in, in resolution uh, of type two diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension or obstructive sleep apnea. Um, but with regards to gastroesophageal reflux, the sleeve did not do as well as the bypass. And looking at mortality and adverse events, they were uh, acceptable, not as low as we'd like to see them. There actually was a death in the gastric bypass group. One of the interesting studies done in the United States was using sleep gastrectomy and gastric bypass compared to medical therapy to treat type two diabetes. And this was uh, created a little bit of a stir back uh, in 2012 when Phil Schauer published this. He was at the Cleveland Clinic then and was able to get 150 uh, obese patients with type two diabetes to get randomized to either medical therapy alone or medical therapy uh, plus gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy. With the primary endpoint he was looking at being a hemoglobin A1C less than 6% at one year. And ultimately with medical therapy alone, about 12% of patients were able to get down to that A1C less than 6% versus 42% with bypass and 37% with sleeve. Other ways to look at that are change in hemoglobin A1C. And you can see that uh, again, the same shape curve, even though we're looking at uh, reduction in hemoglobin A1C and not weight loss here. The average number of diabetes medicines that were being taken by these patients dropped very substantially. And you can see the change in body mass was uh, similar to what we've seen in the other studies. They concluded that for obese patients with poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, 12 months of medical therapy plus bariatric surgery achieved better glycemic control than medical therapy alone. And if you, uh, there are a lot of studies out there that look at some of the other comorbidities. Uh, fatty liver is something that we're certainly interested in treating. Uh, this was a systematic review of 32 cohort studies that looked at uh, what happened with uh, fatty liver disease after bariatric surgery. Steatosis resolved in 66% of patients, inflammation in 50%, ballooning degeneration in three quarters of patients, and fibrosis which we think of really as being a permanent injury resolved or improved in 40% of patients. Does it actually make patients live longer? Um, this is one of the better studies, again, a Swedish study uh, where they looked at the uh, Swedish obesity study data with 24 years of follow-up and compared surgical care for the treatment of obesity to usual obesity care, which is uh, behavioral and dietary management. Again, looking at the body mass index curve over 20 years, you can see that same rapid drop for the first one to two years, followed by a leveling off for the next 20 years. The blue line here is controls and the orange line is surgery. And uh, looking at the life expectancy curve, what they found is that the life expectancy was increased by about a total of three years uh, for obese patients who had surgery compared to obese patients who did not. Interestingly, uh, life expectancy was still five years shorter than the general population who were not obese. 
And this has been looked at even in the pediatric population. There was a policy statement that came out from the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics in 2019, looking at bariatric surgery in the adolescent population. The criteria are a little bit different since they go by uh, uh, not just by body mass index, but also clinical percentiles uh, in terms of selecting patients. But they did uh, recognize that bariatric surgery had a place in the treatment of obese, severely obese adolescents. Now, are there other therapies besides surgery that we can use? Well, there's uh, certain devices which have been published. There's the, uh, a, a bunch of different balloons out there which are used by the gastroenterologists. Um, these are inflatable devices which can be placed uh, often with um, endoscopic guidance. This was the first one which came out, a Orbera balloon in 2015. It's a single balloon about the size of a, maybe a little bit larger than a tennis ball. It's deflated and inserted using endoscopy and then inflated with saline. And it can be filled up to anywhere between 400 and 700 milliliters and serves as a volume displacement device in the stomach, uh, hoping to uh, decrease the functional volume of the stomach. And there have been a bunch of other balloons which have come out since that time. There's uh, the reshape balloon, which is a dual balloon. The idea behind this balloon was that you have two balloons connected by a, a small connecting rod. And that way, if one of them accidentally deflated, the other one would at least keep it from accidentally uh, passing through the pylorus into the small intestine and causing problems. And uh, more recently, the Obalon swallowable balloon came out. This is uh, something which is roughly the size of a pill attached to a little spaghetti tube which can be swallowed by the patient and then inflated with gas. And uh, one or more of these can be placed into the stomach. Uh, they're buoyant because they're filled with gas, not with fluid. Um, and they can sit around for about six months displacing uh, space in the stomach. Um, this was seen as a, as a good option for use in, in the adolescent population because it doesn't require any permanent changes to uh, the anatomy of the stomach or the intestine. Um, this study looked at a two-year cohort of 12 adolescents. The complications were very minimal, but in terms of the weight loss, it was also minimal. From a preoperative body mass index of 46, uh, by the time the balloons had to be removed six months later, uh, the BMI had only dropped to 44. And then after uh, two years later, after the balloon had been placed, the body mass had actually increased from 46 to 49. So these balloons seem to give a little bit of short-term weight loss. They're only approved by the FDA for six months of use, and then they need to be removed. But what about medical therapy? I mean, there's certainly some drugs out there which are effective for weight loss. There's uh, liraglutide, a GLP-1 receptor agonist. It's a daily subcutaneous injection, uh, which results in some weight loss. One of the bigger studies looking at liraglutide showed that at one year, there was about an eight kilogram weight loss versus 2.6 kilograms for placebo. There's a uh, fentermine and topiramate, a fentermine being a sympathomimetic and topiramate a GABA agonist. This is a pill, so it doesn't require an injection. Um, at one year, you see similar weight loss to liraglutide, uh, eight to 10 kilograms in one study versus 1.4 kilograms of weight loss for a placebo. And then there's Orlistat, which is an inhibitor of pancreatic lipase. This is a pill which needs to be taken three times a day at meals. Uh, which was resulted uh, in, in, in one of the bigger studies on Orlistat in an 8% total body weight loss. It does have a lot of side effects, as you would imagine, though, because uh, since it's inhibiting, inhibiting the digestion of fat, patients end up with fatty stools and, and greasy bowel movements. But wait a second. If we read JAMA last month, uh, we read some very interesting articles about the Step 3 randomized clinical, clinical trial uh, looking at semaglutide versus placebo. So uh, this drug seems to be a lot more effective than earlier weight loss medications. Um, this was a high quality study. Uh, it was published in JAMA, looking at 2.4 milligrams of semaglutide versus placebo uh, over a 68 week course. Uh, and they looked at this as an adjunct to intensive behavioral therapy was a multi-center trial looking at 41 sites in the United States over a three-year period. There were 611 participants, 93% of them completed the trial. And at the end of the trial, there was very substantial weight loss. Um, looking at the patients on semaglutide, they had a weight loss of about 16%.
versus 5.7% in the placebo group. Now, there were some adverse events, uh, nausea in 97%, diarrhea in 58%, vomiting in 40%, constipation in 40%. Not too many serious adverse events. There were certainly no deaths, which was nice to see. Uh, some patients did develop gallbladder uh, stones or, or, or uh, other surgical issues requiring surgery, uh, gallbladder infections, and there were some connective tissue side effects as well. But overall, uh, there were, although there were a large number of adverse events, uh, there were a very small number of serious adverse events. I think it is worth, in any study like this, reading the fine print at the end of the study. Uh, Dr. Wadden, who was the, the first author of this, uh, was funded, uh, the whole study was funded by Novo Nordisk, which is the company that makes the medication. And, and the primary author, the first author received both grants and uh, they described personal fees from Novo Nordisk. Uh, does that affect the outcome? I mean, I still think this was a nicely done study, uh, but uh, it clearly is not 100% objective. Uh, what is the cost of this drug gonna be once it is uh, commonly available? Uh, that's unclear. One would think expensive and will it be covered by insurance? Uh, we don't know. Certainly, we've had issues getting some of the, uh, the, the earlier drugs covered by insurance. And how long will it be, uh, how long will one be able to, to use it for is unclear. Nonetheless, there was this, uh, this um, editorial published in, in, in JAMA back in June. Um, and the title, as you can see, that uh, semaglutide may usher in a new dawn for obesity treatment. So what does this mean? Does this spell the end of surgery for the treatment of obesity? I don't think so. And I, I think that the same way that uh, you would never say that only surgery or only medication should be used in the treatment of cancer, I think that we're going to see a combination of surgery and medical therapy uh, being used in a more cohesive uh, uh, manner. And that brings me to the last thing I want to talk about today, which is kind of the next generation of treating obesity at Mount Sinai. Um, this is a, uh, an architectural diagram of the third floor of our FPA building at 5 East 98th Street. And in the upper right-hand corner, this is where I see my bariatric surgery patients. Uh, we have our, our sleep study, our, our, our sleep apnea patients evaluated by the sleep medicine group back here, oh, excuse me. And then we have endocrinology on the other half of this floor. So it's wonderful that we have all of us working at least in close proximity, but it's not really a unified uh, department for obesity yet. And what we are hoping to do is a complete gut renovation of this third floor, which is going to create our comprehensive center for weight management and wellness, which will be a collaboration between medicine and surgery and a bunch of other departments. So we're really going to see collaboration between surgery, medicine, the department of radiology, anesthesia, psychiatry, pediatrics, rehab, uh, all working together uh, on this third floor center. Uh, to treat patients with obesity with both medical and surgical approaches. And the idea is that by having internal coordinators serve as kind of handholders for our patients, uh, they will be able to triage them towards surgery or medical therapy or even back and forth if, if they've had one therapy and that has failed. And we're hoping that by having uh, an internal resource for getting sleep studies, getting rehab, getting psychological evaluations, fatty liver assessments, sleep apnea evaluated, um, that all of this is gonna help patients to uh, have much more flexible access to care and ultimately to have increased quality of care, increased ease for the patient and uh, increased availability of both operative and medical care for our patients. So what's gonna happen in the next decade in the treatment of obesity? I think we are gonna see more use of medications. We're gonna see better medications. We're gonna see uh, more use of medication and surgery together uh, to get perhaps longer lasting and, and, and higher amounts of weight loss. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to working uh, in closer conjunction with the, uh, my medical colleagues in our new comprehensive center for weight management and wellness. Uh, it's in the early stages now. We're talking with the architects about the uh, upcoming renovation, but we're hoping that uh, it should be uh, largely underway, if not even completed, by the end of 2022. So once again, I'd like to thank everyone for, uh, for the pleasure of talking to your, to your group today. Um, you can always contact me if there are any questions about bariatric patients, or if you do have a bariatric patient with a problem, that's my cell phone. I'm always happy to get called with any questions or problems or clinical issues that come up. 
and uh, perhaps we could open the floor to any questions or discussion. Once again, thanks so much for having me here today. It's a, it's a real pleasure to talk. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Well, that was a great review, and I'm glad you mentioned the collaboration we're undergoing for the, uh, the uh, Obesity Center, so that's really great. Um, we do have, we take uh, questions in the chat. <clears throat> There's already one there, and hopefully the others will put some in. Um, Dr. Greenberg, CVC, says, I assume that there is a learning curve as with most procedures. Has that been looked at for adverse events and or weight loss? Well, that's, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and certainly, I think uh, earlier in, in um, earlier in this process, when we were just starting to do bariatric surgery via laparoscopic approaches, so in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we saw a much higher rate of uh, adverse events, things like leaks, technical problems with the surgery, because everyone was still learning the operation at this at that point. Um, if you were looking at mortality rates that would be cited back in the in the late 1990s, they were uh, between one and two percent, uh, which was quite high. Um, that has dropped by more than a factor of 10 in more recent studies. And and these days, most surgeons, or I should say, pretty much all surgeons. Uh, who are going out and doing these operations have been fellowship trained. So they've really had uh, a, a one-year clinical fellowship focusing on minimally invasive surgery and bariatric surgery. And uh, what we've seen is that in fellowship trained surgeons who've had a year of studying this, um, you don't have that same kind of learning curve that we saw in ourselves back in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Gotcha. There's a, a another question from um, Dr. Ginsburg thanking you for the overview. Um, and can you comment on the frequency of anemia, transfusion requirements, failure of PO iron supplementation, not compliance with uh, vitamins and referral to hematology in this patient population? Sure, so what we see, um, it's most severe in the patients who have a, a bypass type operation. So either a gastric bypass or a biliopancreatic diversion. In those operations, um, there are a couple issues. Number one, uh, there's less acidification of the stomach because the stomach is made smaller or bypassed entirely. And also the first portion of uh, the, the, the whole of the duodenum and the first portion of the jejunum are bypassed. So iron uh, absorption is significantly decreased in these patients. And for that reason, we put most patients on an iron supplement. Um, it needs to be an iron supplement, which is which does not require an acidic environment in order to be uh, absorbed. So um, uh, ferrous sulfate generally is not very well absorbed by gastric bypass patients. And we try to use um, organic uh, iron supplements, things like uh, ferrous gluconate, um, which are better absorbed than, than, the, than the sulfate. Um, they also do cause a lot of, you know, issues like constipation and, and GI upset. And so uh, for that reason, there is poor compliance with iron supplementation. And for patients who self discontinue the supplementation, they do end up uh, being anemic. The overall rate of anemia that we see in our patients is about somewhere between five and 10%. Uh, but the, the ones which get so severe that they re, uh, require referral to hematology and, and, and transfusions is about 2%. There is another question um, from Dr. Barlow on the, is there an age limit for these procedures uh, when considering treating the older patients that are overweight? So we used to have a fairly strict uh, age cutoff. We would not treat anyone lower than, uh, younger than 18 or older than 65, uh, but we've uh, kind of gradually relaxed those limits. We're treating now adolescents as young as 13 and we're treating uh, we don't really have an upper age limit, although it would be very rare to treat someone over the age of, of 72. Um, but if someone is uh, physiologically well enough to undergo an operation and has enough uh, expected lifespan to benefit from, from weight loss, you know, we could treat patients as uh, up to the age of 75, I would say, would be a, a rough cutoff. Uh, but we don't have uh, strict limits. Thank you. Um, other questions? I see a question here about what are we doing with patients who had a lap band in the past with some weight loss? I saw a patient like this uh, yesterday 
And you'll really see a, uh, a diverse group of people with the lap band. You're gonna see patients who have had reasonable weight loss and have managed to maintain it and are very pleased with their device. And you're gonna see other people who um, have terrible issues with nausea, vomiting, food intolerance, uh, and even with poor weight loss, even in the presence of, of food intolerance and vomiting. Um, generally, it is worth, if someone has had a, a lap band and has had problems with it, I think it is worth having an upper endoscopy performed to make sure that the band has not caused a problem like an erosion into the lumen of the stomach. Um, and certainly if they're having issues with vomiting, they would need a full metabolic workup to look at things like thiamine deficiency, calcium deficiency, iron deficiency. Um, but if they're unhappy with the band, we can certainly, you know, it's a, a fairly small procedure to go in laparoscopically and remove the band. So uh, at this point of the patients who had the lap band placed at this hospital, about 50% have already had their lap band removed. Mm. They're not a large number of those patients, but uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, there were a, a small number that did have the band placed. About 50% have it removed. Um, Dr. Rappaport has a question saying over the last 10 years or so, there has been a normalization of obesity, perhaps due to its frequency. Have you seen an effect of this on the patients coming to you or having surgery? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, certainly, I think, you know, our, our eyes have become adjusted to kind of a different standard when we see patients and patients you know, who we saw 10 years or 20 years ago, we might have considered heavy, now look not so heavy. Um, interestingly, the criteria that we're using for the treatment of obesity are the same as the ones which were identified in, at that NIH uh, consensus conference back in 1992, uh, which is a BMI of, of 35 or 40. Um, and so when we're operating on a patient with a BMI of 35, it doesn't look all that heavy for <laughs> by looking looking at our patients with a with an eye from 2021. So uh, so the, the criteria have not changed. There is some interest in looking at the use of, of gastric bypass for patients with an even lower BMI, uh, treating the patients BMI 30 to 35 who have severe type 2 diabetes. And in that sense, we're looking at surgery as, as being more of a metabolic procedure than as a weight loss procedure. Uh, but st at this point, that's, that's only being done under an IRB protocol and is not covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Kohler um, is asking if you could comment on changes in food preferences after surgery. Um, again, a very interesting question, and uh, it's a little bit different for everybody. There, there are some changes that we see uh, with gastric bypass, which are a direct result of the uh, Ruan Y anatomy. Um, as I mentioned briefly, patients who have their stomach bypassed will end up with dumping syndrome, which is an unpleasant response to rapid passage of, of, of concentrated uh, carbohydrates into the small intestine. Part of that response is due to a rapid release of insulin from the pancreas, and part of it is due to a rapid influx of, um, of fluids into the lumen of, of the bowel, which results in a kind of a uh, stretching of the bowel and, and a, a vagal response from that. Um, however, what's interesting is that in patients who've had a sleeve gastrectomy and do not have any uh, realignment or, or uh, adjustment of their, uh, of their GI tract, um, they also have changes in their food preferences. And many patients will, it's impossible to predict, but many patients will say that what used to be their favorite food, be it, you know, fried chicken or pizza or whatever, they take one bite of now and they, they can't stomach it. It just uh, doesn't hold any interest for them anymore. And uh, I can't really explain this process. It makes sense when you think about dumping syndrome and carbohydrates, but it doesn't really make much sense in the sleeve gastrectomy where there shouldn't be any dumping syndrome. A little bit of a mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, we can take one last question here. Um, let's see. I once heard of a trial of preventative bariatric surgery on either pre-diabetic or high risk for diabetes individuals with lower BMIs than usual criteria. Um, any results from that? Um, so uh, the, the trials that I'm familiar with are not kind of preventive, but they're looking at treatment of patients with type 2 diabetes, um, but who are not considered morbidly obese 
based <clears throat> on the NIH criteria. So essentially patients with a BMI uh, in the 28 to 35 range who have undergone uh, one of a number of operations. Uh, there have been several studies looking at gastric bypass, looking at um, loop gastric bypass, and several other similar operations. And uh, again, the, it, it seems to be a very effective treatment. There's, uh, there's um, resolution of, I don't want to say resolution, but uh, remission of diabetes in anywhere between 60 and 80% of patients in that weight range. Uh, it's only being done, again, under IRB studies. Uh, it's not being done routinely. And again, it's not something which is, is covered by insurance. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult study to do. Uh, but the results seem to be similar in that, in that 28 to 35 BMI category as we've seen in the 35 and higher. All right. Well, in the interest of time, I think we need to, to finish up. Dr. Herbert, I really appreciate you coming today. It was really a great review of all the surgical procedures and nice to have you add all the medicine ones in too. So you knew your audience. It was great. <laughs> well, fantastic, so, uh, Dr. Thomas. Thank you yeah, so much for having me. It's really been a pleasure. It's great. Well, thanks a lot and looking forward to our collaboration for the new center. Have a all good right. day, everyone. Take it thanks easy. So